This morning, I want to take time and speak to you about something that, you know, everything we, we talk about here at New Harvest as we minister on Wednesdays or Sunday is important for us to our growth, to our relationships with each other, as well as our relationship with Christ. Every word that is spoken, every truth that is given from God's word is there to build us up to strengthen us, to bring maturity into our lives. And as we come to church and we listen to God's word, there are seasons that God's word uh, begins to flourish and and to build. You know, when we get saved, you know, we say a sinner's prayer, uh, and uh, let's say the next day we come to church for the first time, It's not automatic that we are what God wants us to be or that we are in the place that God wants us to be. There's a process that takes, that has to take place. Some processes take longer than others. And one of the things that I want to speak about this morning that is not new to you as a congregation, especially here at New Harvest, and maybe to those who are listening and watching our line, online, is the topic of words. Everybody say that word with me, words. Words, words. How many know that words are powerful? And the words that we speak uh, have uh, power behind them. They have the ability to change uh, the way, even as in a society in which we live, to change the way society looks at life, as well as how we interact with one another. I have some statistics this morning that says since last year, 2023, 566 new words have been added to the dictionary. Think about that. I have enough time just thinking of the words that I already know, let alone having to now start learning 566 new words. And next this year probably will be more. It went on to say that there have been 2,256 revised definition of some of the existing words. Think about that. Some of the words that we normally have used throughout the day, now a lot of those words, actually 2,256 of them, have been revised to mean something different than what we thought they were or to add something on top of that. Craziness. Think about that. Words have the ability to bring hope, words, have the ability to motivate, to build confidence, and uh, to help people overcome defeat, to not give up when a, a, a word that is spoken in a timely fashion. We've seen that throughout history. Think about John Paul Jones, the famous warrior during the American Revolution, who was outgunned, outmanned, and he spoke these words, I have not yet begun to fight. He spoke those words because he was asked by the British uh, Navy to surrender because he was outgunned and outmanned. And it was his words that motivated his men to not give in, to not give up, but continue to fight uh, and have success, even though he was outgunned and outmanned. Uh, He had the victory that day. Words are motivational. They can build. They can strengthen. They can help us to overcome fear. And words that are spoken or words that we've heard will last with us for years. How many know that's true? We remember words or phrases that have been spoken throughout our years, and every once in a while, they'll come up. The other day, uh, Sister Nancy and I were talking, and a movie came up, and I remember before the words were ever spoken, leave the gun, get the cannoli. You know, I mean, these are are words that kind of stick to us and basically leave an impression. But this morning... If we're going to win in life as Christians and achieve all that God has for us as the people of God, then we need to begin to give careful thoughts to the words that we speak, words 
that should line up with God's word as we interact with one another, as we interact at home, at our workplace, and yes, even at church. So I've got a brief video I'd like to show you before uh, I get into uh, the word this morning. So folks, if you have that video ready, go ahead and get it going. You don't have a ton of things in common with God, but there is one thing. You speak. So does he. God spoke light into existence with his words. I wonder what you could speak into existence with your words this week. I wonder what kind of love you could speak into your marriage that feels like it's in neutral. I wonder what kind of courage you could speak into the heart of a child who's hurting. I wonder what kind of peace you could speak into your broken friendship. What kind of hope you could speak into your own weary soul. I want you to know that the most powerful words you're gonna speak this week is probably not gonna be on a stage or a conference call or closing the deal with a client that you want. The most powerful words you're gonna speak is probably just with one or two people listening, maybe zero. It's totally possible that the most powerful sentence you'll say this week is a thoughtful text message that you send to a friend who's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. It's the apology email that you finally get the courage to send it's the whispered prayers through tears in the middle of a dark night. Powerful words aren't just for preachers who stand behind pulpits. They're for parents who stand next to bunk beds. Speak life with their kids. For spouses who share hopes and dreams during pillow talk, and not criticism. For teenagers who stand up to bullies, stand up for the uncool kids. Your tongue is so small, but so powerful. Your tongue is telling a story. Praise God. Amen. Short but powerful. It gives us wisdom and understanding about what words can do in a person's life. In Proverbs, my text, chapter 8 and verse 21, the Word of God says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Powerful words that come from the, the, the wisest man at that time on the face of the earth, that God gives us wisdom and understanding concerning the impact of words that we speak throughout the day, throughout our lives, can either bring life or they can bring death. Because words are containers. They contain power. As Christians, the words we speak are going to be filled with something as we interact with people. Words can either curse or bless. Words can either be filled with hate, fear, doubt, and unbelief. Or words can be filled with love, with joy, with faith, with peace. Words can wound and words can heal. And you know, it's up to you and I as believers, as Christians, uh, how we use our words. Those of you at work, you understand the words that are spoken and, and the impact that words speak from people who don't know the Lord and how those words can tear down and destroy and those words just uh, begin to, to, to quench your spirit because they're not filled with anything from God's, God's word or by the spirit of the Lord, but they're carnal words. They have an impact upon our lives. And we have to be careful the way we use words. I read a story about uh, Winston Churchill, one of my favorite his, history-making uh, uh, men. Winston Churchill was always being accused of being intoxicated. 
which was debunked by his, his bodyguard, his personal bodyguard, and his family members. He drank, but he, he never was intoxicated in public, they said. So one day, as Winston Churchill was leaving the House of Commons, he had an encounter between uh, a female member of parliament, which would be like one of our Congress people or senators, and her name was Bessie Br uh, Braddock. So listen to what happened as he encountered this woman. Bessie Braddock said to uh, Winston, Winston, you are drunk, and what's more, you are disgustingly drunk. Winston looked at her, and replied, Bessie, my dear, you are ugly. And what's more, you are disgustingly ugly. But tomorrow, I shall be sober, and you will still be disgustingly ugly. <laughs> Words, the way we use them, will impact the people we speak to, because words have power. In James chapter 3, in the first five verses, James writes, If anyone can control his tongue, it proves that he has perfect control over himself in every other way. We can make a large horse turn around and go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a tiny rudder, makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot wants it to go, even though the winds are strong. So also the tongue is a small thing, but what enormous damage it can do. So let me ask the question this morning. How many perfect people do we have in this building right now? I don't see anyone raising their hands, so probably goes to the point that we are all imperfect. How many can say amen? amen? There is no one who is perfect this morning, and the Word of God says that only a perfect person can control their tongue and uh, all everything that takes place in their interactions and actions. You see, we've all spoken words that at one time or another have offended someone. How many can say amen? We're not perfect, and those things are going to happen. But we need to understand that when that does happen, that words have power and words are influential. The words we hear or the words that we speak, they have longevity to them, whether positive or negative. For instance, it's so important that we as men, as parents, the words that we speak in the morning should be uplifting because they can make a difference in our children's day or our spouse's day. The first words that they hear should be words that are strengthening and words that build and motivate, not words that tear down because Otherwise, they will go through the day robbed of the blessing and the joy that God intended for them to have. Words that we can use that are filled with strength, with comfort, and confidence, those words register in their minds and in their hearts. Too many times, because of the busyness of the day, the rush of the morning, or whatever time it is that you might be departing your home to go to work. The last words that we speak sometimes are not the words that need to be spoken, are not the words that our kids need to hear or the words that our spouse needs to hear. And we need to be wise of the words because words are containers and they have influence and they are powerful. And eventually those words will take root and it'll begin to take shape in their lives, their minds, and begin to produce negativity or failure in a person's life. Because if you hear you're no good or you're lazy or you'll never amount to anything for, for a long period of time, 
How many know that that's eventually going to impact the way you live? It's going to impact the way you think about yourself. Husbands and wives, the words that we use with each other need to be words of, of, of strength and confidence and words that do not bring fear or doubt into that relationship because those words, I guarantee you the enemy will use those words uh, to drive a wedge between you and your spouse. To begin to drive a wedge between you and your children. That's why it's so, so important that we engage our mind before we engage our mouth. And begin to think about the impact that the words that we speak are going to have on the hearer. Because I don't really think that we have a a full comprehension and understanding of the tremendous power of words because we use them so loosely, don't we? They they come out so freely. You know, we've heard the old saying about men and women and who speaks more than, than, than the other. And I was reading where that, that myth was debunked uh, this last year. Because the myth was, was that women spoke more than men. And they figured it out that women sp- spoke 20,000 words during a day where men only spoke 7,000 words. And so it came out after they did another study that, yes, women do speak more than men do, but it only averaged out about 1,000 more words during the day. So that we are both equally responsible concerning our usage of words and how we use them to speak to others uh, and to speak to each other. Because understanding of how our words influence happenings, situations, and circumstances, and the way people view things, and the way people perceive, many times they, are, they come through the words that we use and that we speak. I think about our society and the words that have been redefined that have, have transformed, in a sense, our nation in so, so many ways that have caused people to be... Um, criticized or people to be almost thrown in jail because of using the wrong verbiage or the wrong words or pronoun. It's coming to a place where we as the people of God have to be so, so cognizant of how we speak to one another and how, how we use the words to describe uh, situations and things that are going on in our lives. Because we can always, you know, a lot of times, use the wrong words. Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 29 gives us an understanding of words that are, are wrong and words that we should stay away from. It says, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Words that are corrupt, words that that, that, that are, are, are defiled, you know, when something is corrupt, like say for instance a hard drive is corrupted, that no longer is the data intelligible it's no good it's, it it no longer is valid and and words that are corrupt are words that are no good that that are not valid and should not be spoken and we have the to take very be very careful about the words we use and li- that that possibly are not lining up with the word of god or don't come out to build people up, to encourage and strengthen people. 
The Bible says the words we use should give grace to those who hear. Giving grace to those who hear is the opposite of what, what we call gossip. Because gossip is like a virus. What is the definition of gossip? Gossip is defined as the private information about others shared in conversation, media, or print. That's what is defined as gossip. Now, I know that you're probably thinking of a person who fits that perfect description. Not you. Not you, but somebody else. It's the way it always is. Someone said, I never gossip. I observe. And then I pass my observations to practically everyone. We have a lot of observers that come to church, don't we? Gossip happens in families, in the workplace, and surprise, surprise, even happens in church. Imagine that. Our ears, we need to protect them from garbage and trash that is, wants to be unloaded to them. Because every time someone gossips, they injure at least three people. These are words that we're speaking about. The one speaking, the one hearing, and the one being gossiped about. And so gossip is like a virus that spreads. Gossip is the devil's Ponzi scheme. You know what a Ponzi scheme is, right? Ponzi scheme is, is, is when corrupt individuals get someone to invest in, in something, and it's their job to get somebody else to invest in that same product or, or, or whatever it might be, and it goes on and on and on and on and on, and the only one that gains is the one who started it, and everybody else loses. That's a Ponzi scheme, and that's what the devil does when people begin to gossip. It's like a virus, because more and more people get involved accommodating the flesh. I remember a story concerning a movie I saw, and it's a good movie. It's called Doubt. It's about a priest who was being accused of something just because of appearances. And um, it's a clean movie, good movie. And there was a section in here that the priest was speaking to uh, his congregation about, and he used this story that he read. And it's a story about a woman who was confessing to the priest that she had gossiped and was very, very sorry about it. So she asked the priest for absolution so she could feel forgiven. The priest said, not so quickly. I want you to go home, take a pillow, and go up to your roof, cut it open with a knife, and return here to me. So the woman went to her home. She took a pillow off of her bed. She took a large knife from the kitchen and went up to her roof and stabbed the pillow over and over and over again. And then she went back to the priest as instructed. The priest asked, did you gut the pillow with a knife? She says, yes, Father. And what were the results? She says, feathers. Yes, feathers. Everywhere, Father, feathers. And the priest said, now I want you to go back and gather up every feather that flew out onto the wind. Well, she said, it can't be done. I don't know where they went. The wind took them all over. And that, said the priest, is gossip. And that's exactly what happens when people get into gossip and don't choose the words uh, that they're going to use or don't think about the words they're going to say. It begins to scatter and we never know where they're going to land and the impact they're going to have. We're human. We will make mistakes. We will say things we wish we never have said. But we need to realize and take stock every day when we rise and read our word. That's the best habit to get into. Read your Bible before you do anything else because that will begin to help you to, to, to get your spirit in order. 
before you go out into the day and experience the garbage that's out there. In James chapter 3, again, in verse 6 through 8, James writes and he says, Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire and itself is set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. No man can tame the tongue. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. You see, and so in our relationships with one another, in our friendships, at work, school, here in church, couples at home, parents with your children, it is so, so critical and important that we understand the power and the influence that words have. I think that we would not see the statistics that we see when it comes to marriages being destroyed if only couples would take time and think about the words that they're speaking to each other. That rather than speaking words of hate and doubt, that words of love and encouragement would be spoken to help each other get through the difficulties of life, of marriage. Nancy and I, this year, will be 55 years married, and it's only been because we've been able to get through the toughness of life and been able to speak to each other, making up, helping each other, getting each other through the problems that we have because we're not perfect. Are we perfect, babe? No. I, I'm not. I know that for a fact. She's better than I am, for guaranteed that. And we've made it this long because we have been able to deal with the words that are spoken and remedy those words and not let them linger, linger, linger and begin to bring an impression. You know what an impression is? Something that leaves a mark. Save your lips for speaking beautiful things, helpful, comforting words. That's our job according to the word of God, to one another and to each other. Words can either bring life or death. I think about the tragedies on the, on the freeways and on the streets of people that have spoken harmful and, and corrupt words to each other that have ended up in death shootings. Because of words, lives being lost. See, Proverbs 12, 6 says, The words of the wicked lie in wait for blood, but the speech of the upright rescues them. See, we can rescue people with good words. Doesn't that sound great? We can help people with words from God's word, words that build, as the scripture said, at strengthen and encourage one that is lost and wavering. Why? Because words are spirit. Words are spiritual. We are spirit. Yes, human, but we are spirit beings also because we have spiritual aspect to our life. John 6, Jesus says, it is a spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And it's the spiritual words that are spoken that give to you and I hope and strength through the word of God. The words that Jesus spoke, 
They're, uh, they are an invisible force. They are an invisible power that breaks strongholds, that break chains, uh, that tear down walls of hatred and bitterness and unbelief and build up confidence and trust uh, in the Almighty God. That is what Jesus is saying. When we apply them to our lives, the spiritual aspect of who we are gets revived uh, and we're able to accomplish what God has for you and I to accomplish. Our lives will produce what God intended for them to produce when we understand and apply God's words in our lives. They are spirit and they are power. Just as God spoke, the atmosphere that we breathe into existence, we also create an atmosphere with the words that we speak around us. The atmosphere in our home is set. The atmosphere when you're with your friends is set. At church is set. And as a result of the words that we speak, you can walk into a room where harsh words have been spoken, where anger is there, when arguments have taken place, and you walk into that room, and you can sense the atmosphere that says, I'm going to get out of here. I don't want anything to do with this. Not a word spoken. It's dead silent, but you can feel it. You can cut it with a knife. Why? Because words have created that atmosphere of unpleasantness, of hurt, of corruption. Words are spirit. And they affect the spirit when we receive them in one way or another, for good or bad. When we hear them, when we come to church, I pray that the words that are spoken, the words that we sing are uplifting, that they strengthen us. They are the right words. We need to learn to speak, not the wrong words, but the right words, because they are also spirit. Right words are words that build and bring strength, uh, words filled with faith and confidence through God's word. Proverbs 25 and verse 11. It says that a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Beautiful picture of, of how words that are spoken aptly or in time or with the right attitude and motive can be so valuable. That's what it's talking about. Silver and gold, valuable. The right words are valuable words. They are words that are worth listening to, words that, that, that are worth speaking. Let's think to ourselves the words that we use and how we use those words, how we insinuate when we speak. We may not actually say the words, but insinuation. Read between the lines a lot of times is what can cause the damage if we're not careful, especially as pastors. Because the Bible says that we will be judged twice, harshly, for the words that we speak than others. Yes, we do speak that bring words that bring correction, that bring discipline. We don't like those kinds of words too much. But those are words that are necessary as we read through the Word of God. That because God loves us, what does He do? He chastises us. He corrects us just as a parent who loves their children has to bring discipline and correction and using words of, of doing that, not, not destructive words, not words that demean or that, that, that tear down, but words that bring correction with, according to God's word. Those are words that God, God's, God says he will honor and that will have an impact and change that child's life. Words. Philippians 4.8, Paul writes, he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, 
whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Why did he say that? Why did he write that? So we can just sit there and meditate and think about, about beautiful things? No. He wrote that so when we do meditate on those things, it's going to impact the words that we speak. It's going to make a difference in the way we interact with someone. The way we speak about someone, the way we, we uh, uh, deal with people. That's why Paul spoke those words. Because our confession is a declaration of our faith and what we speak. If we're always speaking doubt, unbelief, always speaking, speaking down, then we're, that's what's going to be a result of our life and our relationship with God. But if we speak according to God's word and confess with God's word strength and power, then that's who we are going to be. In Psalm 49 and verse 3, the psalmist writes and says, My mouth will speak words of wisdom. The utterance from my heart will give understanding. You see, the words that we speak will reveal what's in our heart and who we are as the people of God. What we think and how we believe. That's why it's so important to study the word, to read the word. Let it become set in you so that when you come against situations uh, that, that are not helpful or things that are taking place that are destructive, you can Turn back to the Word of God in your thinking and begin to say, Yes, Lord, uh, I know this is what's going on, but you say that I have power over all the power of the enemy and nothing that, uh, that is, takes place is going to hurt me. That I have you as my shield and my buckler. You are my protector. Because the words that we speak are the words that we believe about God. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the poor video guys are looking up there, where's that scripture? I don't see it. Because I didn't give it to them. God is spirit. And we need to worship in spirit and truth. And the words that we speak are spirit. When we come to church, we worship, whether in an unknown tongue, or we worship with words that are intelligible. And yet, uh, we, we understand the atmosphere that is set by those words. This morning, such a wonderful spirit of worship and praise. Why? Because of the words that came from God's spirit, worship and praise. I want our team, worship team, to make their way up this morning, if they could. See, we come to worship. We come to sing at church. We come to give, sing words of praise. And they bring a sense of peace, stability, a freedom, and a liberty in the presence of God. This morning, words... Words. We all use them. We all speak them. And we are all responsible for them. You know, it's like owning a, a, a firearm. What they tell you when you own a firearm, obviously, number one, you never point it at anybody. But that you're responsible from the moment the bullet is in that gun or rifle to the point when it leaves and wherever it goes, you're responsible for it. So you better make sure what you're doing when you pull that trigger. So it's the same thing with words. We are responsible from the time the words leave our mouth to wherever they end up just like that bullet. Tragic, sometimes people are killed innocently because a bullet hit something and bounced off and killed them. 
that person's still responsible for that bullet. We're still responsible for the words that we speak. Let's take stock. Let's think. Let's be careful this morning. We're not perfect. I know none of us, any of us. And we're going to say things, unfortunately, we don't want to say by anger, whatever. Ask forgiveness. Pray. But mainly, let's not do it again. So that we can begin to help those. That's our responsibility. Who are in trouble. Who need healing. Who need help. Who are hurting. Let's use our words instead to help them. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed this morning.